This is a work of political and social commentary. The content of this video is not meant for children under the age of 13. Parental discretion is advised. One of the most powerful forces in politics is the grassroots movement. Building up from a groundswell of common sentiment, grassroots movements can and have completely changed the course of political action. America was, in point of fact, founded by grassroots movement, the Founding Fathers. The Civil War was triggered by Southern resistance to a new political party which was founded by members of a grassroots movement, the Abolitionists. American involvement in the Vietnam War ended because of resistance from a grassroots movement, the Flower Children. Oh, and Donald J. Trump was elected president because of a grassroots movement when nearly every career politician, pundit, and Washington insider laughed off his chances at the White House. But not all grassroots movements are the same. A pure grassroots movement arises from the people in a general groundswell, with any organization and funding coming from the average people who are a part of the movement. On the other hand, creating a facsimile of a grassroots movement using paid actors and corporate sponsorship from the very beginning isn't really that difficult, and it isn't that uncommon. We even have a name for it. It's called an astroturf movement, because it looks like a grassroots movement and isn't. But not every political movement which looks like a grassroots movement is either grassroots or astroturf purely. It's more accurate to say that there are 50 shades of green in grassroots politicking, so it's difficult to establish what is reality and what is political spin. Of course, that means it's time for some roasted opinions. This subject is more than a little chewy, especially because of the different opinions about what is grassroots and what is astroturf. I sincerely thank Colleen B. and Taterator for pitching in on the research for this video. If it wasn't for them, this episode would likely be a puff piece on how the media keeps saying Orange Man bad, and Trump keeps saying things that most career politicians would never say within a hundred feet of a journalist or a microphone. They put in a lot of time finding sources on the subject for which they have my deepest appreciation. Merriam-Webster defines grassroots as the basic level of society or of an organization, especially as viewed in relation to higher or more centralized positions of power. Calling a political movement grassroots labels it as being, originating, or operating in or at the basic level of society or of an organization. Per Merriam-Webster, Astroturfing is an organized activity that is intended to create a false impression of a widespread, spontaneously arising grassroots movement in support of or in opposition to something, such as a political policy, but that is in reality initiated and controlled by a concealed group or organization, such as a corporation. So, to clarify both definitions, grassroots political movements are spontaneous and self-organized by citizens at large towards a certain goal and astroturf movements are organized by hidden organizations to exactly resemble a grassroots movement. These definitions will form the basis of how we proceed. Any movement of this kind that meets the definition of grassroots will be considered a grassroots movement, and any movement which meets the definition of astroturf will be considered an astroturf movement. Now for the tricky part. A common sentiment among political pundits is that grassroots and astroturf is a binary set. Either the movement is grassroots or it is astroturf. If that's the case, then there must be a changeover point where grassroots movements become astroturf and vice versa. Looking at the definitions, it would seem that the changeover point involves hidden donors and hidden involvement by those in power. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. The most successful grassroots movements have five aspects in common. They change the way a majority of a jurisdiction's voters view the issue. They use barnstorming, traveling educators, and speakers they have charismatic leaders, they never involve foundations or nonprofits, and they establish active local organizations in numbers appropriate to the geographical scope of their issue. Interestingly enough, as their success increases, grassroots organizations become the very corporate organizations which engage in astroturfing. Look at Earth Day. Started by Dennis Hayes, the movement evolved into the Earth Day Network, a 501c3 organization which boasts on their website that they have at least 75,000 plus active partners and 1 billion individual members. 
They also have over $3 million in annual revenues, over a million dollars in assets, and at least a dozen full-time employees. Every event which they organize meets the definition of astroturfing, especially when they are not the organization putting on the event, which they rarely are. Yet Earth Day and the Earth Day Network are commonly cited as a successful grassroots movement. This duality between grassroots movements and astroturfing is a common problem. Let's look at two other well-known political movements, the Boston Tea Party and the Tea Party Republicans. The Boston Tea Party is often cited as a classic example of grassroots uprising. Yet by the definitions we've just stipulated, it was in fact an astroturf movement. It was organized by the Sons of Liberty, a secret organization founded by Sam Adams to fight the taxation imposed by the British Parliament. The Sons of Liberty were prominent businessmen and leaders in the colonies in the 1760s and 1770s. Many of them are considered founding fathers of the United States and were leaders among colonial society and government. They can only be considered grassroots if one accepts as a given that the colonials were completely bereft of power. Perhaps in Parliament, yes, but as was proven by the American Revolution, the leaders of the colonies actually held considerable power and were able to persuade enough colonists to join them to break free and form their own government. The Boston Tea Party itself was a highly organized protest against taxation without representation. Parliament had levied the Tea Act of 1773, granting the British East India Company a royal monopoly on tea in the colonies. That compelled the colonists to pay the duty imposed by the Townshend Acts on all tea. The Sons of Liberty included many smugglers who brought in less expensive tea that was untaxed from the Dutch. And strangely enough, they didn't like the Tea Act. The Sons of Liberty organized the protests, placing 25 people to prevent the tea shipment from being unloaded from the ships, and disguising the raiders who dumped the tea as Indians. It may have looked like a grassroots movement, and in fact many people have held the Boston Tea Party as an example of a successful grassroots protest, but in actuality it meets nearly every definition of astroturfing. The Tea Party movement followed over 200 years later, but with many of the same concerns that the Sons of Liberty imparted in the Boston Tea Party. Taxes are rarely a popular issue with fiscally conservative people, and the Tea Party movement was and remains a loosely affiliated collection of local and national groups opposed to high taxes and deficit spending. But, like its predecessor, the Tea Party movement also meets the definition of astroturfing. The Koch brothers, wealthy industrialists, organized Citizens for a Sound Economy, the group which effectively ran the Tea Party movement from its inception. CSD later split into Freedom Works and Americans for Prosperity, with the latter remaining under the control of the Koch brothers. Both of these are 501c4 organizations, which allows them to participate in politics so long as their primary purpose is education and social welfare. This provides a key insight into how one can find astroturfing. Look for a 501c4 designation in the organization. A 501c3 cannot participate in politics, but a 501c4 can. That's one of the most common dividing lines which people can find, the number behind the 501c. Now, the involvement of people freely associating with these organizations is textbook grassroots. That provides a problem with clear definitions between grassroots and astroturfing because 501c4 organizations attract considerable support from people who don't donate them a penny. They don't take marching orders from these organizations, and yet they show up to events sponsored by these organizations frequently. Marching on Washington is a popular demonstration which attracts a lot of freely associated grassroots participation. Mailing campaigns for members of Congress is another. Case in point, the National Rifle Association often supports letter-writing campaigns about legislation currently being considered by Congress. Now, the NRA is a massive organization and one of the biggest lobbying groups in the United States. Any campaigns they sponsor would meet the definition of astroturfing. Yet the number of people who support Second Amendment rights exceeds the membership of the NRA by at least an order of magnitude, and their events often attract people who aren't members of the NRA. When surveyed by Pew Research, up to three times as many people claim to be members of the NRA as are reported by the NRA as their members. That suggests that the NRA is a grassroots organization despite their astroturfing activities. So if there is a dividing line between grassroots and astroturfing, it's a shifting point based largely on personal perspectives. Those movements which advocate positions close to where an individual stands on the political spectrum are often viewed by that person as grassroots. The further away a movement is from where a person stands, the more likely it is to be viewed as astroturfing. 
Accusations of astroturfing is a common defense levied against grassroots movements and their agendas, especially since it's common enough for there to be enough astroturfing elements to the activities and organizations which support them to make such accusations fairly accurate. If we accept that there is a dividing line between these two kinds of movements, and how often it becomes a shifting goalpost when people argue about whether a movement is grassroots or astroturf, then we have to consider another common artifact of such arguments. The straw man. Oh, now you remember about me. You've been cutting my segments out of the videos for a long time now. Yes, say hello once again to the straw man and his arguments. When you see a shifting goalpost, look for the straw man and vice versa because the straw man shifts the goalpost nearly every single time. In this kind of politics, both grassroots and astroturf movements make use of straw man arguments all the time. It's a constant of such movements, because the desired purpose of the movement often precedes the evidence supporting that purpose. Any evidence to the contrary is likewise discarded, ignored, or attacked by the straw man. Gee, you're not being very nice to me, Roast. I serve an important function, and you're making it sound like I just cause arguments for the sake of arguing. Often, the straw man arguments are just arguing for the sake of arguing, though. It's a tactic called muddying the waters, and it's pretty effective. Rather than addressing the heart of the issue, proponents on either side argue over the meanings of words and the implications of minutia and even the validity of published sources with dissenting conclusions. The more straw man arguments, the more both sides wind up lost in the weeds, debating trivia and tangents instead of discussing the issues. It's a very polarizing process as well as pressure builds up on either side to win the debate. Of course, by the time that the debate becomes this polarized, the original issue is often set aside. A case in point, the orange man bad meme. Trump wasn't very popular for very long with the major media outlets. The coastal elites tend to stand in opposition, culturally and politically, with blue-collar middle America. And Trump appeals to blue-collar workers with blue-collar values. That's his base. As the media put more pressure on Trump to act more like a career politician and less like a career businessman without a minute of public service on his resume before his election, they strawmanned him more and more in articles. He responded with his own strawman, the fake news argument. That rapidly evolved into his supporters and even some of his detractors embracing the orange man bad meat. Now, whenever Trump says or does anything, from making statements at a press conference to taking a weekend off at Mar-a-Lago, a storm of articles about how horrible Trump is follows. Those articles are largely dismissed by his supporters as just more orange man bad reporting. The fact that many people think that America needs a political outsider as president to break through the cycle of politics as usual is ignored, just as the fact that many see the president as eminently unqualified to lead the country. I'd bet that without the straw man arguments, the people who support Trump would concede that he's making mistakes that no career politician would make, and that people who oppose Trump would admit that there is a self-sustaining swamp in politics that may very well need a political outsider to drain. Yeah. That was a good one. I listed on my resume now. Because of all of this, I'm coming to the opinion that anything which is called grassroots or astroturf actually falls on what I call the grassroturf spectrum. There aren't just two types of movements, but in fact, 50 shades of green. Every step towards organization and fundraising is a step towards astroturf, and every regular person who joins the movement is a step towards grassroots. Most movements of this nature are neither grassroots nor astroturf, but more of what I call a golf course movement. The grass of the movement, the people, is real, but the movement is highly organized and carefully manicured using high-dollar donors and corporate sponsorship, just like an astroturf movement. Right now, I imagine a few of you are wondering why I've introduced my own new definitions to this discussion. Folks, sometimes the existing definitions aren't sufficient. There are almost no pure grassroots movements outside of local area movements addressing a specific local issue, like protesting the installation of parking meters in what was a free parking area in the downtown shopping district. There are also a relatively few astroturfing movements which remain pure astroturf outside of propaganda campaigns sponsored by foreign governments. Most political movements which are considered grassroots actually fall somewhere in between. They have both grassroots and astroturfing aspects, whether they are a grassroots movement which gains corporate sponsorship and high levels of organization influenced by those sponsors, or an astroturfing organization which gains popular support. As both aspects blend, the movement becomes something else. 
which prompts me to use the golf course movement definition to denote this blending. With golf course movements in the middle, between grassroots movements and astroturfing movements, that still doesn't adequately describe how movements start at one end or the other and drift towards the middle as they become successful. Hence my use of the grassroots spectrum to describe all such movements. A few things are true of all movements on the grassroots spectrum. They all want something, they all face opposition, sometimes even from each other, and they all have some very noisy people who are convinced that only they and people like them are smart enough to understand the real world. At least we know that the world won't run out of hot air so long as such movements exist. 